Uh, so and he starts sh- shoving pages in her mouth, like crumpled up, <laughs> burning his hand at this point. And he's like, "I'm already missing a thumb and a foot." <laughs> I can take. What's a-, a fucking blister? <laughs> Fuck it. Eat this bitch. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Cracking Spines Podcast. I'm here with Candace, getting ready, or Frank, as I like to call her, getting ready to discuss uh, Stephen King's misery, because last week, <laughs> uh, we have some atoning to do. Thank and you, you for know, coming back. Yeah, you know you know, your, your podcast is taking a turn when Stephen King is your palate cleanser. So <laughs> here we are. Yeah, this one's better. Uh, if you would like to sponsor us, we would love for you to go ahead and contact us at info at crackingspinespodcast.com and uh, tell us how much you want to pay us and we'll talk. Be sure to follow us on our social medias. You can find them on our link tree at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash cracking spines. Uh, you can also go to our website, crackingspinespodcast.com. You can hear us on all platforms except for Spotify and Pandora is going to take a while. Awesome. Let's get into misery. Let's. Let get the miserable. misery. Let's get miserable. <laughs> Let the misery commence. All right. Trigger warning. We will be discussing addiction in this this episode. Yeah. Best-selling novelist Paul Sheldon thinks he's finally free of misery chestane. In a controversial career move, he's just killed off the popular protagonist of his beloved romance series in favor for expanding his creative horizons. But such a change doesn't come without consequences. After a near-fatal car accident in rural Colorado leaves his body broken, Paul finds himself at the mercy of the terrifying rescuer who's nursing him back to health, his self-proclaimed number one fan, Annie Wilkes. And he's very upset over what Paul did to Misery and demands that he find a way to bring her back by writing a new novel, his best yet and one that's all for her. After all, Paul has all the time in the world to do so as prisoner in her isolated house. And Annie has some very persuasive and violent methods to get exactly what she wants. Uh, let's get into it. So the first part of the book, we see he's getting ready. He takes off from his place in Boulder, Colorado. He's driving to L.A. Because, or San Francisco, one of the places in uh, the West Coast, because he's done with New York for whatever reason. Right. Taking his only copy, because he doesn't make another copy, no matter how much people tell him to. Taking his only copy to... Of his new book. Of his new book. That uh, he's fast dr- cars. Drunk on champagne, celebrating that he's done with his book. While driving in his fancy, flashy sports car, uh, hits a snowstorm that was supposed to track south, but ended up tracking towards them and goes off the road and yep. rolls a car a couple times. And it's just. Yeah, we're right in it. Like, a mess. First 20 pages, she's pulling him out of that car. His pelvis is shattered. His legs are broken. He's a mangled mess. The idea that <laughs> of all your fans, that fan is the one that found you. I know. The first time I read it, I was waiting for us to discover that she'd actually like been following him and stalking him and like put something in the road and like caused the accident because it's like I mean they never not huge said that coincidence. <laughs> they they didn't not say that. They didn't say it, but they didn't also like not say it. Because I felt the same thing <laughs> the whole time. I'm like, mm, coincidental much. Yeah. His number one fan in the whole world just happens upon his wreckage, pulls him out, brings him back. He wakes up, like, what is going on? Right. What is happening here? She's got him in a room. He he quickly, like, at first he's like, okay, this person's taking care of me. But then he has questions like, why hasn't she called an ambulance? Why why am I not in a hospital? Like, he's just coming out. First, he's in a drug daze. He's just got out of a really, like, traumatic accident. His legs are all mangled and put together with two by fours and duct tape. <laughs> Nursing 101. <laughs> so the ingenuity is just... A little bit of dental floss. And, and she's he, talking to him like they're old friends. Yeah. Like which has got to be disorienting. Completely. And then he's noticing, like, because she's gushing over the book being her favorite um, and the series being her favorite and how she's read all the books like six times each. And, like, she she was on her way back uh, with this book when she found him. And he's realizing quickly, uh, this person's not right. Right. And this person's also about to find out I killed off her favorite a uh, character of her favorite series. Mm-hmm. She's giving him, hopping him up on this drug, Novril, which is supposed to be like an opioid of some kind to like keep him like out of it. She's accidentally already overdosed him and he had respiratory issues that so she had to bring him back. As soon as he wakes up, he realizes he's he's hooked on this drug. Yeah, and he has memories of from, the only memory really from the crash, like he says in the book, a lot of car crash survivors have is like they remember driving and then they the next thing they remember is just them being awake. And his description of was her and her nasty breath, breathing life back into him. Violently. Violently saying, come on, Paul, come on. Yeah. So, oh, God. Like we both have this face right now. We're just like, oh. Uh. 
the dragon's breath from the dragon lady. Oh, yeah, God. forcing herself on him was the language that he uses. Yeah, that like he, just, ra- he was. She was raping his mouth, his yeah, lungs. Yeah, with her despite breath. Despite bringing him back, he just wanted her to go away. to go away, <laughs> which sets the tone for this whole book. She is bringing him to life, and he knows in that moment he needs this to like. He knows what she's doing. He acknowledges that it's CPR. Yeah. But he hates her instantly like, and just wants her to go away. Yeah. So, like, the needing and the hating. So, uh, I I was exploring some ideas here, and there was, there was a question I wanted to bring up about the beginning part of this. It's a, so, the first part of this, he's trapped in this room. He's kind of getting his bearings straight. Uh, she is actively, actively torturing him. But, uh, but at this point, she loves him. Oh, loves him. Because at this point, it's important to note that he's got his manuscript with him. It's she's got his stuff safely tucked away mm-hmm. because she's in the middle of reading his last book. Yeah. And so Oh, she, she's read all of his books like six times. Fawning all over him. I've read all of your books. Well, the misery books I've read twenty times, but your other books I've read. I once think she or twice. was actually she found him on her way back from picking up his yeah. most recent book. So for the first chunk of this, she's fawning all over him because and he knows she's working her way through the book to the end. Yes. Was she heading up to bed and he noticed that she was three quarters of the way through? Yeah. Uh, Knowing damn well that he has killed Misery off in the end of this book. Right. Throughout this experience with her, when she realizes (laughs) he just killed off and ended her favorite series, she goes batshit crazy. Yeah. And it was around that time he, when she left the room to go up to bed, she shuts the door and he hears the rattle of the key in the the lock and he realizes like- prisoner. I'm a prisoner in this situation. And throughout the entire thing, he's held captive. Now, later, she, having gone through all his stuff, has found Fast Cars, his new manuscript, his new book, as he would call it, his manuscript. And she reads it and decides, like, oh, no, I hate this. All the swearing and... Yeah, it's it's not misery. It's like, not a love story. And... It's not what she wants it to be. Right. So... She's asking him to burn this only copy. So she's not just going to be physically torturing him. Like she goes into that later. She starts by mentally and emotionally torturing him. She waits until he's in a withdrawal. Yeah, too. She waits until she knows that he's going to be desperate. He's listening to the clock. He knows he's an hour past when he's due for his meds. And she walks in with three of them in her hand when he is in Full on shaking withdrawal. withdrawal. Yeah. She timed <laughs> sweating. She timed that moment perfectly. Because she does have medical background as a nurse. Right. So uh, I put together this question here that I want you guys to think about. The story takes place in 1987, roughly. I did the math, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in chapter 17, Paul is kicking himself for not chapter 17 of book one, part one, because mm-hmm. each part starts with the chapter one. Right. Uh, in chapter 17, you would know that if you read. In chapter 17, Paul is kicking himself for having not made a copy of his manuscript, Fast Cars. He replays the many times his exes and mother would tell him he was crazy for not having a copy, followed by their what ifs. His reasoning for not making copies was superstitious. Clearly that superstition failed him. And he uses his only copy of Fast Cars against him, forcing him to burn it. Just one torture tactic she uses against Paul. Mm Mm-hmm. With today's technology giving us the ability to send an entire manuscript over the internet instantly, having a copy automatically backed up to a cloud, also having a copy on your computer, etc., would Paul have ever ended up imprisoned by Annie in the first place? Could this story exist in the present day? And even without technology, would a copy have saved Paul emotional and mental torment? Mm Mm-hmm. Do you think he would have just been like, yeah, sure, fucking burn it. <laughs> Another one at the... For sure. <laughs> could could she have imprisoned him? Obviously. Obviously. Obviously, she could have. Um, but if he wasn't running, if he could have just sent it over the internet, would there have been any reason for him to... Yeah, the, the burning it? of his manuscript would not have been the thing, but I have complete faith in Annie that she would have found something. And the burning has a symbol... There's symbolism in burning, too. So fire usually is also, like water, is representative of uh, destruction and rebirth. So as he's destroying this one manuscript that he is like, this is the best thing I've ever written, right. blah, blah, blah. And he's watching this all go away, knowing that he should have... But there was a reason for him not to have. Right. Like overall, like hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, he should have made another copy of this, but he didn't. So he's watching his like quote unquote greatest creation just be burnt away. Right. And as the story progresses, he starts to invest himself in the new uh, version of 
misery. Well, she makes him do one page at a time, the first 10 pages. Yeah. She's like, I'm not going to make you do the whole book, but this is symbolic and I, I need you to feel what it feels like to burn each page individually. Once you get through the first 10, we can just throw the whole lot yeah. in the pit. Like she knew. By this point, she's already like, she's made the impression. She's she's crazy. She's right. a fucking Looney Tune at this point. Right. And he is clearly understanding how vulnerable of a position he's in. He's understanding like the withdrawals he's going through. So he's getting, he's getting mentally, emotionally, physically abused by this person that's claiming to be there to take care of him and uh, gaslight him and all this stuff. And in the moment of burning this manuscript and the pieces flying around, he sees panic in her face for the first time. And he starts to realize, oh, there's a moment here where he, he, he sees where he has the upper hand and it's fully foreshadowing. Yeah. It's full foreshadowing. And For I, sure. I, I'm surprised I didn't catch it because I was like, how does he in the end get to her? Like, and so like, we'll get to that a little bit later. You would know if you read the book, <laughs> we'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> but your point about the symbolism of burning and how she recognizes that and she acknowledges it brings me to one of my favorite things in this book, which is Stephen King writing a writer. And that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. I He put a lot of himself in this book and it's something to pay attention to. If you haven't read the book and you're planning on reading it, look out for all of these moments where he talks about how all the books he wrote before or the Misery series have a soft spot in his heart. He hates how popular this one got. He hates that he's like chained to it. Anybody who's read the Gunslinger series in the beginning, the intro to it, mm -hmm. he talks about a car accident he got into in the past, mm -hmm. how that ended up leading to addiction. And so like he's already inserted that part into the story. For sure. And did you catch all the Stephen King Easter eggs in this? There's a moment where he's going through her keepsakes mm -hmm. and one of the news clippings references the Overlook Hotel, which is from The Shining. Yeah. So the line is the old hotel called the Overlook. It burned down 10 years ago. The caretaker had burned it down. Everyone in town knew he was crazy. Throughout this entire book, he's leaving Easter eggs. That, like this is my experience as a writer. It's, I, it's I, found an it, I think it's an allegory. It's beautiful. I, Stephen King's fun to read even when he's not writing about a writer, but him writing about a writer was just so well, also, fun like, to crawl in that part of his brain. Yeah, and when you're and when you're uncut jams, um, when you're <laughs> uncut jams. When you're, uh, you're when, glitching, I'm glitching <laughs> where, uh, you start to get into like the more violent moments. Yeah. It makes you wonder like, what is this in reference to? Yeah. What, who is he talking? Is he talking about withdrawal? Is he talking about his moments where he felt like he couldn't go, he couldn't move on, go forward, uh, not just in his career, but like, uh, as a writer with writer's block and an addiction. And it's a really interesting, like you get to like look into someone's mind. Mm -hmm. You're only like peeking through the blinds. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can only see so much to the right and the left and what's directly in front of you. But like, you know, there's other in other rooms and yeah. you want to know what's, what's in there. Absolutely. I mean, the last line of, of the entire book is Lovell, Maine, September 1984, Bangor, Maine, 1986. My tale is told. I mean, he flat out told you yeah. there's a lot of me in this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in part one, uh, he has a moment where through all his studies as an author, he does his research to make sure there's as much realism as, as possible. And one of the things he, he learns is how to pick locks. And he learned it from a detective that right. like came around with uh, boosting cars when he was learning to write for the character in Fast Cars. He uses that knowledge to pick a lock to go venture outside of his space, right? His first venture out, she has finished misery and she just disappears for yeah. two days yeah oh she, she we later find out she's getting a typewriter to ask him to do this but she just disappears and he's like okay this is my moment <laughs> let me see if i can get out of here and he picks the lock and he ventures out of the room yeah that's that's a turning point yeah. so this is this is the this is the part of the story the hero's journey where he's crossing the threshold he's going out into another part of this world where he is I think this is actually a really good opportunity to talk about the hero's journey. Yeah. So uh, the hero's journey, you have a status quo. That's him in his uh, his apartment, writing the story, smoking cigarettes, getting his champagne, taking off, driving. And the accident is basically what is called the immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. And then you have somebody come along, which would be Annie. And then Annie takes him home and puts him into a uh his new room this this is crossing the threshold into this new world then as he crosses over the actual threshold and this is where he has his first like real challenge he's looking for pain medication yeah because she left for two days she left for two days and he's like this is my chance and as the reader i'm like yeah get the hell out of there oh me i don't care if you have to roll down the hill for me i was like go get a knife 
Which he eventually, we get there, but this first venture out. And then this out, fucking dumbass, when he does finally get the knife, he's like, oh, I'm going to take the biggest one out of the block. Get a kitchen. Dig in a drawer. Everyone has extra steak knives that aren't in the block. She's not going to notice that shit. It was only the thought of the pills, the Norville that she kept somewhere in the house, which kept him moving. Yeah. And he passes what a, a flittering thought in his brain is like, the That's, that way is the front door. She always seems to come from over here. But she here. always seems to come from over here. And I mean, he he, he he sniffed it out like a he's blood He's sweating, hammer. he's in pain, and he says, just think of the pills, just think of the pills, just think of the pills. Like, he, he's just repeating that in his head. I have a actual personal history with this. So I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia when I was about 25, and I dealt with it for about seven years. And uh, all the medications they tried me on I was allergic to, so they just kept me comfortable with painkillers and muscle relaxers. And I understand the thought process of, I'm in extreme pain, I don't have any pills near me, it's get to him like sitting in traffic for an hour where you're doing everything you can to breathe through the pain just like keep focusing on eventually you'll be there eventually you'll get it eventually like the desperation that you're feeling in that moment and also like how over it you are yeah. <laughs> like how you just want it to stop and like uh, there's points in your pain where you're always in constant pain for so long that you're just like end it dude I can't take this anymore mm -hmm. but you have to push yourself through that will and that need to survive is like fleeting but uh, and I, I think we see this like fleeting will to survive as he starts writing <laughs> misery. Like there's no more like I need to escape. He has all these opportunities, but then he like holds himself back. Well, yeah, she comes back and she gives him his second drug. Oh, yeah. And then also his, his he, typewriter. She yeah. gives him a new thing to be addicted to this book, man. I mean, so she comes back and she's like, let's. Let's move forward, basically. Like, I, I, I went away for a couple of days, but I'm good now. So she goes to this, this place <laughs> up, the, up the road. It's probably, like, I want to say, like, nine to ten miles away. She goes to this, it's like a neighbor's house. She calls it her laughing place. Her, her, Yeah, her laughing place where she can go up there and just basically scream into, like, a void. And she comes back like, I'm better. Um, <laughs> she keeps referring to her husband as, she, herself as a widow. But they're just divorced. They divorced. Like, they never really address that part. Yeah. He's dead to her. Yeah, dead to her, but, like... But she didn't keep the name. She didn't keep the name. She changed her name back. And that's so Annie. She hasn't, like... She's not delusional. Uh, well... Well, I mean, like... A little bit. But that... It, she's not delusional. She knows that he's not dead. Yeah. It, these moments of, like, calculation. Yes. Okay, so she's really upset with the language that's used in Fast Cars. Mm -hmm. right? His manuscript that we burned. His manuscript. Uh, and this is before the burning. Annie is upset that Tony Bonacero, the main character of Fast Cars, right. uh, ha is using profanity. She says it has no mobility. Paul responds to her, yes, I understand what you mean, Annie. It's true that Tony Bonacero has no nobility. Uh, he's a slum kid trying to get out of a bad environment, you see. And those words, everybody uses those words in, and then she screams, they do not. She goes on to be like, what am I, like, do I use those words? And then I, I go down to the, the street to the bank and say to him, here's one big bastard of a check and you better give me 50 effing dollars just as effing quick as you can. Do you think that when they put me up on the stand and, and then she stops. Mm -hmm. He's like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Right. And so throughout the book, she she hints towards the situation in, in Denver. Um, the wheelchair was much more expensive. She said, awesome supplies have gone right out of sight since I breaks off again a little bit further on no one stops because they all know annie wilkes is crazy they all know what she did even if they did find me innocent so <laughs> he, yeah. he he immediately gets to see oh this is a pattern yeah he's wondering like we're wondering she's a nurse she never leaves yeah. she's clearly not a nurse anymore so he's wondering what we're wondering <laughs> also annie goes slips in and out of or darkness, mm -hmm. as he refers to it as. So, uh, like, it almost like there's a blankness behind her eyes. She, like, kind of checks out. She goes catatonic for, like, a few minutes where she's lost in whatever. Like, what? it's a, a light switch got turned off. Right. She gets stuck in the dark in her own head. And that's when, like, the bad side of her comes out. And you see this, like, constant battle of her back and forth. And she's starting to lose her memory. And She's very volatile. She's quick, very volatile. Quick to rage quick to rage slips into de depressive states. and then she blames him for her rage like she she won't she won't right take accountability 
for her rage, which... Mm -hmm. Right. We get a glimpse into um, when they're sitting around talking about the movie theater that her and her brother would go to when they were kids. Her brother, Paul. Her brother, Paul. When she's reminiscing, (laughs) our main character and us get an insight into, oh, she's been like this for a long time. Because she's telling a story about how they would go back to the theater week after week. And these episodes, these chapter books that were brought to life, these chapter books that were brought to life in the theater would end on cliffhangers because they're discussing the motif of the cliffhanger. And do you remember this? Yeah. And then at one point, um, one of them uh, came back wrong. Right. So (laughs) the theatrical device of the the car going off the cliff and the driver's still in it. And next week, see what happens. And next week, the episode starts just before the car goes off the cliff. And you see him like dive out. And you see him like dive dive out, out, which we didn't see in the episode before. And she loses her mind. Because they cheated. They cheated. The story, which that plays a big role as we go into the second part. Right. Kids, of the in the, book. kids in the theater were cheering because Rocket Man got out, but I wasn't cheering. I was mad, Paul. I started yelling. This isn't what happened last week. Her episode goes on and on to where she talks about how they got kicked out of the theater. She got dragged out of there as a child. So we see that this isn't a divorce thing. This isn't something that happened in her career. Like, She's had this darkness. Forever. Forever. And this is the question I had for you. Why is obsession such a fertile ground for characters when we're trying to make them terrifying? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, okay, so I've actually had a stalker. (laughs) I had one for 11 years. Um, Now, being from Long Beach, California, which I think that's the first time I've ever said it on this uh, podcast, but I'm from Long Beach. Three episodes. Wow. I know. The restraint you have shown. I have shown. So (laughs) So I was like, please happen upon me at some point. See what happens. Just knowing this person, like, because I had never like seen the person. So that makes it even worse. I kind of had an idea of what they looked like and who they were, Mm -hmm. but I I had never seen them and they would show up to my work and then I I would be described what they looked like by somebody. So at any point, this person could have happened upon me and I would not have known and I would have to react in the moment that they reacted. And this person did have a lot of mental health issues. And one of the biggest things that I remember asking um, the judge when we went in for uh, the restraining orders and the name changes and all this other stuff to get away from him, uh, because it was like 11 years that this person was following my husband and then... uh, attached on to me in the process uh i was like i don't really want him going to jail i want him to get help I, he needs mental like help Help, yeah like so like you, you guys need to do a psychiatric evaluation on him don't just like put him in jail and then let him out like he needs help like the obsession i think the, the way obsession works with creating terror is that it wears you down where you're just like oh, just leave me alone already mm-hmm. it's this point of like there's nothing you can do to make them stop right like you've tried everything. You've tried legal. You've tried this. You tried that. And in his situation, he tries to quell her like anger, and he tries to be cutesy and smiley and friendly with her. Like if I, but she can still slip into her darkness, right? And turn on him. And there's moments in it where he's like, he's like, oh, I know it's your darkness. Like he, he's like, oh, I know that's not you. <laughs> like, right? You know, and he tries to play like, this character to her. Yeah. Uh, he's like, hey, I think the sa- I, I think the same way about you that you think about you. Right. I'm on your side, and like it's it's very survivalist of him. Mm-hmm. But like again, this like need to survive. The more uh, the obsession creates the fear and the panic in him, the right. less of his need to survive exists because he gets to that point where he's just exhausted with it, and he's like, just fuck, do something already. Right. Like, what am I waiting for? Yeah, she did. She wore him down in that regard, too. And Annie Wilkes is one of Stephen King's more scary characters. Probably one of the scariest. And she's a middle-aged woman in the middle of Colorado. I mean, and- but it's it's that volatile is the word that we've used. But if you've only seen, like, little, like, the trailer to the movie or you've heard about it, like, from pop culture, it's easy to say she's obsessed with Paul. Yeah. She's not, you know? Yeah. She's obsessed with misery. But really, when you boil it down to it, she's obsessed with continuity. And that's what makes her terrifying. Because you never know what she's going to consider a break in continuity. Yes. Those are the moments where we see either when she's telling the story from her childhood or with Paul where she snaps. Because to her, this is cheating. Yeah. And back to that point you were making about um, how we were talking about how this is like an allegory. Mm -hmm. To I think Annie is a great personification of not addiction itself, but of the fiending of addiction. Mm -hmm. The the, the part of addiction that creates the desperation in you. Uh, not just like, oh, hey, this drug is something that I want or I need. It's how you start to go through the sweats in your, your spine and you have this like fear that you're going to start going through withdrawal and and that's why you need to get your next fix. And like she's the perfect personification of the worry of that feeling coming back to you. And that's something that every drug addict is trying to avoid at all costs mm. is to get away from the idea of 
that withdrawal coming. Yeah. Annie, Annie is that terror that addicts experience knowing that they are going to be going into something that's going to make them feel pain, misery, like, like, uh, Mm. desperation, hopelessness, which to me, I think hopelessness is the scariest of all, uh, emotions a person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish hopelessness on my worst enemy. Yeah. Like that's just the terror in somebody's eyes is in a hopeless moment is maxed out. Right. Maxed out. And I think that Annie represents this like, it's just a perfect personification of the fear of withdrawal and the, the, the driving force behind your addiction. Do you think her house is part of that allegory? The moment he realizes that you mentioned the key mm-hmm. and he realizes I'm a prisoner. Yeah. Do you think together her and the house... He, well, Stephen she, King is sort of writing his experience into and through addiction. This, I mean, I feel like at first I was like, oh, it's an allegory of his, like his addiction. It's just an addiction in general. Right. For any of those unaware, I have, I have conquered several addictions when it comes to drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, like you name it. I've, I've gone through it. I've, I've tried, I dabbled and I got stuck on it, but locking yourself, like locking him in when you're going deep into your addiction, it's like being locked in a room mm-hmm. that you can't get out of. And the few attempts that he's made, he makes to get out of the room, he is fearful and he wants to get, he's fearful of that withdrawal person, that that personification of withdrawal coming back. Yeah. So he wants to go back into the room where at least he knows in there, um, he can still be under his influence. He can still have all his pills. He still like has, he knows she's going to come and give him another dose. and Semblance like, of control. Yeah. It, it's not so much control. It's more of like your safe space. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it becomes like a safe space. Like you're enclosed in this, in where the addiction wants you to be. That's the safest place for you to be as far as you're concerned. Yeah. And so I think the Dang. house and the house represents that, that space that addiction wants you to be in specifically that room. Cause eventually, even when he starts to venture out from the room, he realizes he's locked in the house. Right. He can't get out of the house even. The windows are sealed. I mean, he's... he's And that personification of withdrawal is always a threat at all times, every time. And he even considers lighting the house on fire. Yeah. Knowing that he'll go with it because there's no way out, but at least, at least this would be over. Yeah, and that I, I that's that's a hopeless moment for him when he thinks that. Yeah, he is in that. But and he wants to take out. And the whole point is for him to take out the addiction with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And oh, what's beautiful about this whole story <laughs> is even when he gets out of it, she's always there. Yeah, just like the idea, like you're. It's one day at a time. You just have to not do whatever your addiction is each day. Like you wake up. Your whole whole goal for the entire day is don't fall back into your addiction. You go to bed. You start over every day and so like to rush to the end real quickly uh without like going through the meat of the part he has these like hallucinations of her in places and it like makes him panic and freak out and then he like he gets it together and gets it together and that's like kind of that that craving that addiction like like knocking on your door being like hey i'm still out here yeah i'm still following you around like because i'm in here you may may have gotten out but you'll never be free of me right i'm in your head yeah, and so, oh, like, I just got to chill. Dude, like, Stephen a, King left it all on the page, man. Bro, <laughs> like, he, so what I love about this, and this is why, like, I highly encourage people talking to others about reading the same book, is because I'm reading this, and I'm not really looking into it that deep, like, in that sense. I'm looking more at, like, the the story structure and what's happening in the story, but then you have, you know, uh, Frank here come along and <laughs> tell me, like, oh, yeah, what about addiction? And I was like, I, I, she had mentioned, like, she was going to, discuss that a little bit and I kept clear I think I intentionally kept it clear in my head to not like read run for into, it read for it mm-hmm. and then like when the more you, we pull this apart the more you start to realize this is an allegory for addiction mm-hmm. not like just something in his past or whatever because he has personal experience from it so that's the best way to write is from having experienced it but like which is why it makes sense to me that when Stephen King sat down to finally write this when he was clean he wrote Paul yeah so we're going into uh, section two where he starts writing the book that she wants him to write. Right. And this this is him. This is his survival. Now, now that we've explored this concept of addiction, I want to know where this novel comes in. Him writing it, his need to write it is, is he satisfying? He's satisfying the beast. And by satisfying the beast, he's satisfying himself. Right. So um, <laughs> he has this to... really beautiful moment where he's trying to figure something out. He's trying to figure something out in the story. He's not just going through the motions like he was when he was writing chapter one. By the time he's in chapter 12, he's stuck and he can't figure out how how did this character get there? And I mean, he wakes up from a dead sleep. Yeah. And is like, it's come to me. Yes. She's giving him Norville, which was the, the drug that kept him there when we're talking about his relationship to yeah. escape. And now as 
writing Misery progresses, Misery is the drug that makes him want to leave. Yeah. Now we start thinking about escape. Yeah. The more he starts to write, there's there's a vengeance. Like so when you he even makes at one point makes the decision to start weaning himself off the pills, mm-hmm. which doesn't really work out because that's not how addiction works. Right. So um, he starts to replace one addiction with another. And right. this helps him focus a little bit more. This is him finding normalcy. He's becoming yeah. functional addict at right. this point. This is where like- his He's got addi- a routine. Yeah, his addiction starting to function for him, which is normally where an addict would probably start to think like, oh, I got this under control. It's not that bad. And you start to see this in him where he's like, he has moments where it's almost like he forgets that he's captive. Mm-hmm. He almost forgets that he has this gremlin of a beast. That he's a prisoner. So he starts writing this book. So he's 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 in it to win it. The the N doesn't work. So oh, on the typewriter, yeah. On the typewriter. This typewriter. Yeah. Like when he says this thing, grinned at him with a toothless smile, just fucking pissed him off. I think it hurt him. Because it was like, oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> there goes your E, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> It was like all the R, like the only thing he had left of like the most common letters was the R, the S, and the L. Well, but they'd fallen into a rhythm, right? Yeah. He would write. She, she would, would take the pages. She'd the fill ends. in all the, the ends that were missing. He had a meal schedule. I mean, like weeks go by. Yeah. Uh, like a significant, like a season passes. This, this, this takes place over almost a year. Yeah. A little, I think it was over a year. Yeah. Months go by of their just in this rhythm. And then she slips into this depressive state and he starts noticing that she's just walking around the house in her slippers, puttering around. He makes a note that he'd done research into depressive episodes, Mm -hmm. manic depressive episodes. And he recognizes that she's slipping into one. And he's even like, are you okay? Yeah, Annie, you all right? And that's when she disappears for a long time. And it's almost like he starts to sympathize with her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's sympathy. Maybe it is, but he's starting to understand her. He's He's starting to understand her. He's starting to somewhat predict her. He's starting to figure out his addiction. So this is the point, and I, I think in a person's uh, addiction where they realize they have the problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So first, the problem started. It was just lost in, don't end up in withdrawal. Then he got into his routine with it to where he's like, oh, I'm functioning. Mm-hmm. And then he starts to move into that segment of your addiction where you're like, oh, I have a problem. And I think that's where we're at with him trying to learn her. Mm-hmm. Where he starts to figure out with her because it's a defense mechanism that he's using. He's he's learning. Okay, where are my red flags and my green flags? Where am I safe with her and when am I not safe with her? So he's like constantly aware of when that withdrawal could possibly attack. Mm-hmm. And so he he stays in. He tries to stay in this fixed position, and he slowly starts to realize how he can catch her off guard. He they he, they mentioned the the Shahrazad. Right mm-hmm. um, yeah. from was it Tales of Thousand One Nights? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the just a background on that, and the reason why it keeps getting brought up is the Sultan takes wives, and usually uh, at the end of the night he has killed his wife. Right, and so he takes on this new wife, and so what she does, which is a running theme with the chapter stories and things like that, is she tells him stories. She tells the Sultan stories, but she like hangs it on a cliffhanger. So that way he has to know what happens the next day. So she continues to keep telling him these stories until it like to keep herself alive. He considers himself as a Shahrazad to Annie. He keeps that withdrawal at bay. He right. keeps getting his fix uh, just enough. He keeps satisfying the withdrawal enough to keep her at bay. But like with most addiction, with all addiction, there are going to be moments where you cannot satisfy that withdrawal and that withdrawal is going to come at you mm-hmm. and you're going to experience suffering. Which brings us to him finding her book and realizing how terrifying she really is. Yeah. And that I think I when he finds her book, like... She disappears for a couple of days to her her laughing place. Her laughing place. During this depressive episode, he ventures out into different places of the house this time. Yes. And stumbles upon her memory book, which is a collection of all of her kills. Going Um, back to 11 years old, I think, is the... uh, Yeah, so... She has mentioned to him like these brats that she used to hate, like babysitting. First story he finds is... Them all dying in a house fire. uh, Kills her father... Mm-hmm. Uh, by having him trip over clothes downstairs, her college roommate, same thing, different places, different times, different newspapers. But they they evolve from personal to kills that she's doing at work. Oh yeah, as yeah. she gets her license, they yeah, start off she, personal. She has this need to kill almost like mm-hmm. it. Like she's uh, it's it's not like an angel of mercy type of situation. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just picking victims. Uh, it's easy for her to get away with long sickness. 
Mm-hmm. Long sickness, short sickness, long, 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 short, long, long. Like she has like a pattern to try to like throw it off. And it, 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 it's not suspected when you're working end of life care, which is what she's doing. But then she's in the maternity ward. Mater- maternity ward. She's the, the head nurse of maternity. And so babies start dying. Yeah. And, and that gets attention fast. That, yeah. And that's when she ends up on um, the stand. Looking back on this past is like looking at what addiction does to other people. Mm-hmm. So addiction causes this death and this death and this death and this death and these, 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 these. It can cause death in the elderly. It can cause death in the young. It can cause death at the hands of their own. It can cause People death at the love. hands of others. Yes. So it, like it, it affects all, all aspects of life. And I think that Stephen King gives like a great visualization of that by starting like from a young stages of your addiction, it's dangerous. And it increasingly gets more and more dangerous as the addiction continues. And this addiction can affect everybody from the young to the old. It doesn't matter. Some people can make it through their entire life and it can still get them at the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people can, it can get them as early as the beginning. And I think that's like, I think that was like a great way to paint out this picture of this death book that she did leave out for him to find. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Which that is the part that it's very, like, very soon after we find out that she's known he's been getting out this. Whole oh time. yeah. She's because it works to her advantage. That, that brings us into part three of the book. Beautifully. So moving into part three of the book, he is starting to think to himself like, okay, I need to figure out how to get out of this situation. He's starting, he's starting to come to terms with the fact that I have a problem. Like right. he's coming to terms with this addiction, right? Since we're going to, we're going to run with this motif. He, he starts to fight back against this demon, uh, Annie. He starts to fight back against Annie. He's, he's, he starts to have more attitude with her. He's like, this is not how it's going to work. She's starting to become more impatient with him. Um, eventually it gets to the point where she's just like absolutely the fuck not dude one of his one of her his times out right yeah and she is in a full episode oh yeah full episode he describes her episode on one of his ventures out he sees there's like you know a plate with a single pancake on it he sees like the effects of her episodes because she's always on a routine she's always cleaning here's the vacuum they watch nightly shows at night when she wheels the tv in like right. they're starting to build this relationship that occurs out of like routine so he's he sees like in one of her times where she goes to her laughing place he's already he's already checked out he's like snuck around the house looked at everything realized she had all of the best locks that can't be picked everywhere um it's when he finds the book yeah it's when he finds the book and she she comes home and she just drugs him into like a comatose state. And the way she finds out is because she lays strands of her own hair across everything to find them broken. She's known about it from the very first time that he he leaves the room. She knew that he left the room. She knew he was hiding pills. She saw those scuffs on the wall. She saw the scuffs. Like she's super particular. She's super sharp, super aware. This is where I think that the turning point. Oh, yeah. This is a real big turning point because this is when the hobbling happens. Yes. She, and it is not the way it is in the movie. <laughs> like she doesn't just like knock his foot against the board and break his ankle. She chops his fucking foot off. Yep. Brings in an axe, not a sledgehammer. She brings in an he's, axe. He's hypodermic needle fully out. Like he knows this is the moment that Annie's going to do what Annie's going to do. This is when trying to appease the, the demon, the monster that is his addiction it oh, yeah. is going to result in withdrawal regardless. And beautifully. Stephen King has Paul offer up his other drug. I'll do anything. Don't do this. Because he thinks she's going to kill him. Yeah. And he's like, I'll do anything you want with misery. Think of misery. Yeah. How, what did I do? What can I change? I can, he he offers up that one. Yeah. And he, throughout everything before this, he's like, that's not how this works. Right. But he he offers up misery quickly to her. He, he's like, I will give you whatever you want, basically. Right. Just don't. <laughs> Don't force me to go through this uh, pain, this withdrawal, this situation. Right. Like, don't make me face this. And so that brought me to another question. Before the hobbling, it was obvious that Paul needed to kill Annie. Yeah. These, uh, this plays into the idea of him leaving the room so many times. Finally, she's like, hey, you're not going anywhere anymore. Yeah. And this is why she hobbles him is to, to punish him, to scare him even more. At one point, she takes off his thumb. Like mm-hmm. she burns the flesh with a blowtorch. The blowtorch to, to like cauterize it. Cauterize the wound. Yeah. So before the hobbling, it was obvious that Paul wanted to kill Annie if he wanted to survive being held captive. After missing several opportunities, Annie reveals she has been aware that Paul has been leaving his locked room. She relieves him of the knife he had stowed away under the mattress on a night she dosed him to keep him asleep. This is also when she fixes the lock on the door, which is why he could not understand why she didn't figure the lock out. Right. So she's hiding the fact that she knows he's been getting out. 
from the moment he loses a knife, as the reader, I started getting creative for him and have thought of ways to finally put an end to his misery. <laughs> See what I did there? See what you did there. Did there? How would you, or in what ways did you think, Paul could have killed Annie post-hobbling? I had some real creative ones. Yeah. The, the writer piece of me always wanted him to kill her somehow with the typewriter. Whether yes. it was pulling off one of those. Because he makes it clear he's not strong enough to take her on. Like, he's not strong enough no. to take on the addiction himself. Oh, yeah. Like, he, he needs something to he, help him. He needs aids, help. Aids, aids, aid him through it. So, the beauty of using the other addiction to kill that one he had lost his knife but like there are a lot of parts inside that thing that's okay that so you can just that's what dab I was into her eyeball. i was like i was like <laughs> i would have ripped out so many of the um the keyhole the arms yeah that hold the the letters the, the letter arms. flew into his lap yeah i would have ripped a whole bunch of those out gripped them all together like you know you're holding a bunch of spoons or something yeah. and just full send into stabby her stabby like I need help getting into my chair. You cut my fucking foot off, bitch. Right, right yeah. near. Right. Okay, I thought jugular. <laughs> I feel like it's hitting that vein. You might have to struggle for a minute, but you know she's gonna go out at one point. I'm like, bro, do or die. Drop sack. Stab her in the neck. <laughs> like, <laughs> Fucking front, hoof her in the front butt. Like, just go for it. Act like you want to leave. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how he's going to hoof her with a broken foot, but like, um, and then it's also in this like portion where like, uh, while she's gone, he, he gets to see how resourceful she is because he can watch her out the window and he's watching the seasons change, showing that like addiction is, is not just like an overnight thing or something you deal with. Like it, this, this lasts through a good portion of your life. This, this takes up different seasons of your life it, and he, it's he remarks, always present he remarks on how he hadn't realized that much time had passed yeah there, there were times when he lost time yeah and so then he started trying to meticulously keep keep aware of it because uh the calendar wouldn't change because addiction doesn't care wh whether you know how long it's been but he knew when the clock was going to chime yeah because that meant like hey it's time for a fix so he has a very like throughout the story he tells about his very very graphic very graphic imagination throughout this time what he's talking about facing annie and things that annie is capable of and when he goes into the his own imagination and it builds up these terrifying moments for him so his own imagination is working against him and it's almost like he's trying to play into that tortured artist motif so, so vivid yeah and he says that every time he has a thought he has to fight it off and not and he puts it in, I, in italics and in and in parentheses yeah so vivid yeah like he scares himself he does and so the beauty in this in section three mm -hmm. is him coming to terms with the fact that i have to take this monster on mm -hmm. head on and he sees a glimmer of hope and in that moment Oh, the, the scene with the, the ashtray in the window is probably one of the most like prolific, the right word. The scene is, it just speaks so well to addiction where he wanted to scream for help. That moment where he can't allow himself to scream. That's the addiction being like, you still want this. Oh yeah. But he knows he has to scream. So it takes everything inside of him to not just like break that window but to yell out for help it, it, like his it's a literal cry for help he reaches out like reaches out for help like by literally breaking this window he's having trouble finding his voice to scream to yell for this 23 year old officer that she just goes holy hell on this cross <laughs> see, what, see what you did there <laughs> yeah like fucking just stabs him in the back like, right in the back with the cross like and then in the chest and then runs over his face with a lawnmower and like she starts running through how she's gonna get away with it with him yeah fucking crazy like how she does this like she she's like okay so they're gonna come here and ask um about it like because she's had a run in with the law before she knows exactly like how and this speaks beautifully to addiction because he usually your first attempt at getting help and getting out will fail you in some way mm -hmm. and this is your addiction's way of being like you're not getting away from me and this is like our conversation earlier about she calls herself a widower but has no behavior that tells you that she's delusional and thinks that her husband died she's there yeah like she has a darkness oh for she, sure and she's aware of it and she's aware of it but it's the calculation combined with her obsession that makes her one of the most terrifying characters he's written. That part. Pennywise could never. It's so calculating and cold. This so now is, we start moving quickly into... Yeah, she moves him down into the basement right. He where he sees 
the fire, the, again, fire plays this, this, this part of transformation, this rebirth in him. This is, this is his escape This burning desire at this point, a literal burning desire to get away from the beast. That is his addiction. That is his withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that is, that's personified by Annie. So while he's down there, he gets a lighter fluid, hides it in his pants. His escape in his planning, in his mind yeah. involves taking her out. Yeah. And to the point where David he, and Goliath show up. Yeah. And he doesn't say a word. And she was like, I was waiting for you to say something. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Because he's not just trying to escape. Because she, she is addiction. Yeah. He he wants to defeat her. And this is like Stephen, Stephen King is making it very clear. Yeah. Someone can take away all your drugs. That doesn't take away your addiction. You have to you have to uh, conquer your own addiction. You can have all the help in the world. But until you conquer it, it's going to hang on to you. It's going to always be there. Escaping, getting out alive is secondary yeah. to taking her out. Because if he escapes her, she can always come find him again. Mm -hmm. He can end up in the situation again mm -hmm. unless he he's able to take her down. And the way he takes her down, <laughs> fuck, I was like, this man knows how to write violence, violent scenes. Like it kept going and going and going yeah. and going. She would not go quiet into that dark night. Every time he thought, they always come back. That was beautiful. Every time in in this in this whole story of addiction, down to the bitter end. He was like, stay down. <laughs> he fucking <laughs> lit, he lit the story on fire. Well, not even the story because he hid it under the bed. Mm -hmm. he, he, he takes a good portion of the story that he lit on fire uh, on the bed. She goes to put it out because she needs to save misery, her own obsession, his misery. Uh, so he starts she, shoving pages in her mouth. Like crumpled up, <laughs> burning his hand at this point. And he's like, I'm already missing a thumb and a foot. <laughs> I can take What's a, a fucking blister? <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> Eat this bitch. <laughs> he he's like full on like your turn. Like the way she shoved pills down his throat. Yeah. He he took her addiction and shoved it down her throat mm -hmm. to make it be the end of her. Mm -hmm. The way she was trying to make his addiction become the end of him. She catches on fire. He tries to pin her into this fire, force feeding her just pages. Just force feeding her Ch all the misery she can fucking take. <laughs> Choke on it. Choke on it. Yeah, you suck it, bitch. <laughs> and then, like, works is somehow, like, she gets up and he's like, Jesus Christ, she won't go down. Yeah. And then she, like, gets up, fucking face plants into the side of a, uh, into the side of the mantle, which the mantle has played such a big part in uh, the story, you know, because that's where the typewriter is held. That's where, like, is really the last thing that he sees in the room, looks at, so on and so forth. Um, she face plants into it. I yeah. really would love to have seen her face. I want to see yeah. the dent in her soul. <laughs> her clothes have burned off of her. She's still not down. She's still, she's, you know, choking and rasping for like air after having burning pieces of paper shoved down her fucking throat. Right. He gets out and he runs to his safe place where all the pills are. Mm -hmm. And he locks him. He locks her in the room and her fingers are under the door. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, what the fuck? And he like, and then so he shoves her fingers back under. I would have left him there so I could at least keep an eye on her. Yeah. And he like, he just like, get away from me completely. Like just her fingers creeped him the fuck out. Locks himself in the bathroom without the toilet <laughs> and like yeah. waits it out. So then he knows I have to leave at some, I have to get out of here. Right. I have to get out of here. And so he crawls out. Expecting to see her hiding behind the couch. Expecting to see his addiction come out of this corner, out of that shadow, oh, out yeah. of this shadow. The suspense like, is like... This is, this is the initial time when you are like, I am done. Now you're now you're like, he just faced his withdrawals. Mm -hmm. That That's the significance of that fight in the end is he faced his withdrawals that he had been avoiding that whole time or trying to avoid that whole time in the, in the discussion of addiction. Good call on catching that, by the way, for this book. <laughs> so I was even looking at it like that. Anyway, so he faces the withdrawal finally when he has this like epic battle with her, right? This is like where he just escapes death. Um, that's part of the hero's journey. He has to go see, is she there? Mm -hmm. And then the terrifying realization, she is not there anymore. It's right. not, he doesn't even see it. David and Goliath come back. He sees him outside. He breaks the window and starts screaming for help. Right. They come in and uh, they go looking for her and they're like, she's not in there. Right. And he's just terrified because that means that monster, that addiction, that withdrawal that he just felt like that's that, that's that feeling like, like I, I'm at the peak of my withdrawal mm -hmm. 
And I can't, I might go back. And he's warning them. Yeah. Be, like, she's, like, like, be careful. She's yeah. up there. Like <laughs> this is, this addiction is no joke. He's <laughs> worried that she's going to get them. Yeah. Turns out she died concussed in her barn. Right. Um, died from her wounds. <laughs> died from her wounds. Finally, he gets away and we, we go into part four of this book, right? Mm -hmm. So we did spend a lot of time on part two of this book because that's where all the meat is. Right. Literally, that's where majority of the story happens. And you have the turning point um, that is part three where, you know, he goes through different trials and tribulations and eventually the hobbling, um, him sneaking out, him finding things. These are different trials and tribulations he has to go through. And usually in the hero's journey, it ends with the ultimate where they either die and come back to life or they just cheat death, which is his fight with Annie in the very end when he kills her. And then once he's saved and rescued by these helpers, he's taken away. That's crossing the threshold back over. And there is all these moments where he thinks that she's there. But he has to keep in his mind she's dead because he was made aware that she was dead. He takes his uh, book with him and uh, he this this book that she forced him to write becomes one of his best oh, best yeah. books he ever wrote. Oh, and because the story came out about what happened to him. Yeah. So everybody and, wants to read the book that he yeah. wrote in captivity. I mean, I would. And his agents like write the nonfiction version of it, right? Your story. <laughs> and he's, he's like, like, I don't know mm. how to do that. <laughs> like, I can't. But so then he returns to the new status quo, you know, like he has moments of PTSD flashbacks. He oh, has, for sure. and like, he's scared that she's always there. He's always nervous. Always he has worried. to remind himself that his housekeeper is the one that moves something. Yeah. Yeah. He, he like makes, first him, of all, bro, makes a note. You're not ready. Fire her. <laughs> you should be working on a routine. If you're battling addiction. Okay. Like, but we, it's one day circle. at a time. I mean, you you mentioned this in the beginning. He's just getting through the hours. Yeah. Just, yeah. And so it's... And that's where we leave him. Having read it, not even like on that level, like I was looking at just, I was so caught up in just how the danger of Annie progressed, like the, the fear of withdrawal progresses. And the longer you stay in your addiction, the worse that withdrawal is going to become. Mm -hmm. The longer he stays with Annie, the worse her violence and her danger becomes. Uh... You have moments where you think you can escape and you and it's just your addiction reminding you you can't escape. You mm -hmm. might be able to move about, but now you're not in your comfort zone. You want you're, you want to be back in your comfort zone right now. And that comfort zone is where you experience your high the most. Right. So this this theme, this this allegory of addiction is what I'm going to call this at this point, um, not even just like his own, but you can speak from experience. And obviously Steven is speaking from experience because of how he ended up in the position of addiction in the first place. Yeah, the specifics of it are very much part of his own story. I, I think that the number one thing I would want readers to take from this, having been an addict going through exactly what it is to experience withdrawal and experience the fear of not being able to get out and all that, how terrifying this was for the addict, Paul. Mm -hmm. That is how terrifying the concept of leaving your addiction is. And this is something that people that don't experience addiction don't understand. They don't understand how much it's going to take from a person. It is life or death. Mm -hmm. It is a fight where if you do what it wants, there's a chance that it'll keep you alive. If you don't do what it wants, there's a chance that it'll kill you. But ultimately you have to take that risk and get away from it mm -hmm. because- And it's consuming. It's con all consuming. It consumes all, every every inch of you, every aspect of you, every part of you. Which is taking the foot, taking the thumb. Yes. You know, and little it, by little by little. She's and the violence in him finally combating his addiction and seeking that sobriety, seeking that freedom. Mm -hmm. When he finally goes for his freedom, it's very calculated and it has to be very calculated. You can't force somebody into sobriety. They have to take it upon themselves and figure out their way out. Mm -hmm. You can guide them, you can help them. You can show them that there's help on the other side. There's going to be a failure. They got to keep trying. And this book spoke so well to all of that. Mm -hmm. So well to all of that. Safe to say we liked this one. I absolutely loved it. This is a giggles for me. Without further ado, should we do bookends? I think we should do bookends. All right. So this is our segment where we ask all the questions we think y'all should be asking yourself. That, that part. All right. First all right. one. Who are we buying this book for? Okay. So I don't know if I would suggest this to somebody that is currently battling addiction. I do think I would suggest this to someone that is just in the clear enough 
to remind them of how bad addiction really is to them mm-hmm. so that they don't run back to it. Okay. Um, or to the parents that just cannot understand what or their any child or any, any loved one that just cannot understand what their, their loved one is going through when battling addiction. This mm-hmm. will give you a whole nother, another outlook on that. Your turn. Okay. I would recommend it to that whole group of people out there who say, I don't really read Stephen King cause I don't like horror. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not really horror. It's yeah. I mean, suspense yeah. more than anything. It's not a romantic comedy, but well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> All right, so if, you, if you're looking for an obsessive love story, there you go. Uh, but no, there's a whole group of people out there who don't read Stephen King because yeah. they think it's all Pet Cemetery. Yeah. You know, it, it's all Pennywise. Yeah. And this is beautiful storytelling. Even even if you don't catch the addiction piece, Which, or, by or the if way, the addiction piece doesn't speak to you, this is still a brilliant writer writing about a writer, and that comes and across. And it's an easy read. It's an easy read. You f- I mean, it's you fly through it. All right. What questions do we think our listeners should take to their book club when they all read Stephen King's Misery? Ooh, I got a good one since I've been talking to you guys about um, symbolism, especially the symbolism of water. Now we've learned fire today, but let's go back to water really quickly. Paul, in the beginning of the book, describes his own physical pain as the tide rising and falling over pilings in the water, an image locked into a childhood memory spent at the beach with his parents. He uses a similar description when discussing Misery's Jeffrey's emotional pain replacing pilings with rocks. What function does this symbolism play in King's Misery? Can a connection be made between Paul's pain, the telling of Misery's return, and Paul's experience under Annie's care? Nice. So, I mean, we kind of answered that with her addiction question or whatever, but fine. (laughs) Well... My question we've really addressed as well, but how does his relationship to escape evolve and de-evolve? Yeah, because he does, like, I, I think it's uh, that that area of I'm functional. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's the, the de-evolve. Right. And uh, Just, eventually he gets to a point where he realizes he can't function. Right. He can't function in that space. Right. Just even if you're just looking at the when does when does escape even occur to him? When is yes. it on his radar and when is it like not even in his mind? He even says in the book, like, you have to get out of here. Yeah. He reminds himself, like, don't forget what we're, what we're trying to do. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, that's sober him, like, reasoning with addict him. Like, right. we got to get out, dude. Yeah. Like, the, the arch of his relationship. Very much that. To escape. What about, what's your, what's the, what's the next question? All right. This is already a movie, a beloved movie. And yes. it's hard to top Kathy Bates. But who would you cast if they decided foolishly? To remake the movie. I don't think it'd be foolish once you hear my answer. Oh, okay. okay. So now uh, I'm intrigued. Who who would you put as Paul? <laughs> I had Jude Law in mind. The that would be so you guys can't see it right now, but my <laughs> chin is in my lap. But that like you know how he's like humoring her with that like false, like, oh yeah, Annie, and then she leaves and he's like Ugh. This would be the second movie both these uh actors have been in together. No, who do you have? Melissa McCarthy. Melissa <gasps> McCarthy could play that danger and that that like she yeah she's a comedic actor but she could commit to that role of that terrifying person so well you guys can't see it right now but my chin is in my lap (laughs) like oh my god that would be such a good movie also spy was hilarious (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) any movie she's in is great but uh yeah Yeah. i I saw i saw melissa mccarthy okay now i want them to remake the movie i do too like sorry (laughs) kathy who All right, guys. So thank you for joining us for Stephen King's Misery. Uh, We are going into next month. Next month, we will be talking about different motifs from different uh, childhood fairy tales. Fun fact, the difference between a fairy tale and a folk tale is fairy tale is the written tradition. Folk tale is the oral tradition of storytelling. There will be two books that will be required for this reading. Uh, That will be The Great Fairy Tale Tradition from Strapola and Basile to the Brothers Grimm by Jack Zipes. And then we will have Folk and Fairy Tales edited by Martin Hallett and Barbara Karasek, fourth edition. You can find both of these books on kit.co slash Cracking Spines Podcast. You can also find the store on our link tree at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash Cracking Spines. If you're only going to be getting one of these books... The book to get would be The Great Fairy Tale Tradition by Jack Zipes. Mm-hmm. 
These books, I know we're only reading a few stories out of each, but I promise you guys, endless reading with these. And we're going to be revisiting them. We, we yeah, we March will, we, will not be the only time that these will be on the reading list. We have some resources on the store for you guys to take a look at. A Hero with a Thousand Faces discusses the hero's journey, which we were talking about today. Right. Um, I will try to, if you guys are on the Discord, I will put up a video uh, that explains, a, a YouTube video that explains the hero's journey that I've referred to in the past. We also have the Herder's Dictionary as symbols. So you guys can uh, look into symbols more. It's just a fun book to go through just in general. Uh, we also have many of the different materials that we use for marking our pages, annotating, all of that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but these books for uh, next month, they're a great resource. Oh, absolutely. I, I've, I've read a story, like a, a, new, a new interpretation of The Three Little Pigs on a live on TikTok and everybody was like, what is happening right. right now? It's, it's really, it's a really cool concept. And but it's material that you're, you're familiar with. Yes. Not yes. all of it, but you're going to be familiar with, with a good chunk of it. So even if you're using it for reading on your own, yeah. there's some really great stuff in there. Yeah. Also wanted to say congratulations to Amelie. She won our, uh, little contest on who got to name the segment right. bookends bookends I think is perfect yes it was beautiful we got a lot of good suggestions but you had to go with what was the favorite join us Saturday March 5th for the fruitful sleep motif we will be reading Briar Rose by the Brothers Grimm Sun Moon and Talia by Gian Battista Basile and Sleeping Beauty by Charles Peralt not as much reading as it sounds it's about 18 pages uh some of your childhood favorites we really are encouraging you to make sure you pick up the edition that we have. It's available again in the store, yep. kit.co slash Cracking Spines podcast. And uh, prepare to have some of your childhoods ruined. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a blast. Can't wait. Hope you guys enjoyed Misery as much as we did. <laughs> Stay miserable. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>